Okay, um, so let's click, uh, let's go through this. So again, chapter six is all about quads, four-sided figures, right? That's what we've been talking about. Uh, that's what we're gonna be going into. Lots of different properties. Each section is usually about one specific type. Oops, I mean, it's got the turn on. Um, anyways, uh, so for the quads, let's go through this. Let's see, just hold it. I think this will work. Cool. Whatever you want to do. we've been uh, walking through, right? These are ones we've had in chapter two, we had them in chapter three, we talked about a little bit in chapter four, you know, when we talked about the triangles themselves. Uh, the triangle itself is one of the first types of polygons we've had. It was a three-sided figure. We talked about all the different classifications of triangles, you know, acute, right, obtuse. You had that in the last chapter test. Uh, we had scaling, isosceles, equilateral, those were by its wall lengths. We talked about like, isosceles a lot in chapter four. Uh, it was like the last couple sections, especially equilateral. Uh, then right triangle is all chapter eight. Um, then we talk about the quads, four set of figures. That's what this chapter is all about. Uh, the goal today is to intro what those words were one more time, because this has been a long time since we've talked about the actual quads themselves. I think it was like chapter three and chapter two, we were talking about the quads themselves. Well, this chapter, we actually talk about the specific properties about them. Not just what you know how many walls there are and what the names are, but specific things that are unique about quads. Because we talked about lots about triangles, you know, how to find certain wall lengths, what altitudes are, um, you know, that sort of thing. But quads, we're going to talk about all those same types of things. Uh, Pentagon, we're, um, this is something that, you know, the properties we get today will apply to pentagons and, and below. You know, pentagons, a five-sided figure. Um, we talked about hexagons at six. How I always remember hexagon, it has an X in it, like the number six. That's how I always remember it. Um, heptagon or septagon at seven. Um, I usually use heptagon, that's usually the word that I use. Um, octagon is eight. Uh, nonagon or nonagon. I actually prefer nonagon. That's actually what most textbooks have. Um, your book has both. I think it has like nonagon and then it has right next to it nonagon like this. Um, Decagon is 10. Deca is literally the metric word for 10. Um, that's, what, that's what we use. Uh, 11 gon or hen decagon, that's usually the word that your textbook uses a lot. It's hen decagon, that means 11. It's one more than 10, hen decagon. And then dodecagon is two more than 10, so 12. But these are the, these are the main categories, right? The properties we learned today in this very first section, because the first section, chapter six, intros what the polygons are, these, which we already had, but then it talks about three properties, three, and they apply to all of them. So they're very generic things. Not, you know, not area and volume, we'll eventually get to that. You know, uh, we'll eventually review what area is for these shapes. We'll eventually review what, you know, how to find volume if we go three-dimensional shapes. Uh, but the goal here is to learn generic things that we can talk about with these shapes. You know, like interior angles, exterior angles, diagonals. That's our three main words today. So we'll talk about those. But um, the thing we've been talking about is this, you know, these these shapes, right? These are all the shapes of all the uh, all the different items. You know, these, you know, usually I never give you the later ones because they look the same. Um, but triangle three-sided. These just happen, to, the pictures I picked here are all regular. These are called regular polygons. They're all like they all have the same wall lengths. They all have the exact same angles on the inside. So a uh, regular triangle is an equilateral triangle or equiangular. And we have you know the the quad here, which is a square. Then a pentagon, <coughs> hexagon, heptagon, octagon, nongon. And if, as you notice, every time I add a wall, what is it eventually molding into? A circle. A circle. A circle is basically the 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 limit. A uh, limit is um, what happens when you approach infinity as you go down the road. Uh, it's the limit as uh, the number of walls increase. So like as as the number of walls increase to like a hundred or a thousand walls, eventually it just appears to be a circle. That's what it's turning into. Uh, that's one of the major things that they talk in calculus is the idea of a limit. As you go up to the idea of infinity, what does the shape turn into? 
But these are the shapes. That's usually why I don't show you these later ones. They all just kind of look the same. They just look, they just look silly when you actually see how many walls there are. Uh, but again, the goal today is to actually look at, you know, to actually look at the properties that apply to all of them. All, all 12 of these shapes. All 10, I should say, all 10 shapes. Okay, questions at all about the names? Okay, uh, the three problems we have are very easy. They're very simple formulas because like the last chapter, we did a lot of formulas and a lot of things. Uh, that's something we're going to have in this chapter. You know, the first section, they're going to ask you a series of questions about, you know, finding the interior angles, finding the exterior angles, finding the number of diagonals, little things like that, how many walls there are, how many vertices. Simple little questions about vocab terms. You know, nothing overly difficult. And then as we go to the later sections, then they focus just on these quads, the four set of figures, because we were talking about triangles. Okay, any questions before I go to the next slide? Everyone, everyone has all the words. Anyone still need it? Okay, Nolan, you good? You got it? Yeah. Okay, all right. Okay, moving on. Um, so let's go to the quads. Let's talk, actually talk about the, you know, the number of sides to it. So a quad has four sides, right? Quad meaning four. Uh, it's four-sided, four vertices, that type of thing. The sides are also called edges. The vertices are the corners. These are where the angles are. Um, remember, capital letters for the vertices, lowercase letters for walls, for walls, they'll use lowercase letters. Um, and then the angles in the corners, they can use the Greek letters. You know, thetas and betas and other things. That's what we used in the, the last chapter when we did triangles. When we're finding angles, they use the Greek letters. They only use theta a lot. That was the kind of the go-to letter they always used. Um, variable, I should say. Um, but from now on, since we have four, they're going to start using other words, like other symbols now as well. Um, but anyways, there's the different classifications, right? There's different subcategories to just having a four-sided figure. And what we talked about, you know, back in Chapter 2, um, we talked about that when you're classifying a quad, it doesn't have to be a subcategory. It doesn't have to be one of these two that I'm about to show you. If it's special enough and it fits a certain definition, then it could be one of these, these two other categories. And we talked about, I think back in Chapter 2, talked about the pyramids and we talked about some other like uh, geometry types of buildings that we uh, that we have around the world that use quads and they use triangles and they use other things so we focused a lot on the history stuff uh, today is just to get these words down and one more time if you don't remember because it's been a while that was you know last semester so the quad itself two categories one of them is called a parallelogram uh, we'll, we'll get to the definition here that uh, to that here in a second and then the second one is called a trapezoid those are the two main categories. Now, there's technically kind of a third category, which is called a kite. We, I think we see the kite in, I think, the very last section of this, of this <coughs> chapter. I think it's like section 6-6, six, six. they talk about the kite and what it is, what it looks like, why it's, why it's kind of the weird, weird blend of like a parallelogram and a trapezoid, why it's, it doesn't really fit any of those categories. We'll look at it. All right, questions about the, the actual shapes. Okay, let's get to these definitions here first. Let's, I want to talk about parallelogram uh, first, and then we'll get to the trapezoid. Uh, once we get to those basic definitions, then we'll hop into each one and look at the little, little subcategories. But again, you should have had this. This should be something you already have in your notes, but maybe you're rewriting it to remember it. All right, let's get to the first one. So uh, again, we're talking about just the quad itself. The two main types, the parallelogram is the first one. Here's the, the generic shape that I always show you. And the shape that I want you to focus on is this one. It's the shadowed edge. That is a parallelogram. Okay, that the shadowed edge of the, you know, the, the eraser, the pink pearl. It's the most iconic kind of school classroom thing. Okay, so but a parallelogram by definition has opposite sides are parallel. That's all it says. That's why they use the word parallel in the actual name, parallelogram, right? It's a figure where the walls opposites are parallel. So opposites means across from each other. So like the top and bottom are parallel to each other. And they usually use like little arrows to signify that. That just means that they're not gonna touch. And then the other two walls would be parallel as well. So these two would be parallel to each other. 
Now again, parallel doesn't mean equal in size. It just means that they're not going to touch. Um, it actually implies certain angles are the same, and we'll get into that, because that was something we talked about a lot in Chapter 3. You know, parallel lines and the angles that come up. Okay, questions about parallelograms? Okay, we'll get to the subcategories of those. Second one was a trapezoid. The trapezoid, by definition, is kind of like a parallelogram, but it only has one pair of parallel sides. One pair of sides are parallel. And so, you know, the, the image I always show is like a skateboard ramp. It's like a wedge. It's actually the shape of a, a razor blade, you know, if you shave. But um, I think door wedges, they used to, like, back when I was in elementary school, they always had door wedges to keep the doors open. They didn't have the little hooks at the top. But um, this is always something they always shoved underneath the door. It's just a little wood block. has, you know, has one tapered side, it has the parallel top and bottom, so it sits flat on the floor. Okay, now obviously, throughout the chapter, these shapes have very specific properties because of the walls being parallel in certain cases, like both walls being parallel and one pair of sides are parallel. That forces the picture to have very specific properties compared to just generic quads. That's why they're very different. So that's why they'll separate these into their own sections. I think this trapezoid, I think it's like the, the fifth section, I think, or fourth. And then parallelogram is really what they spend most of the chapter on because there's more shapes in the, like, the subcategories to a parallelogram. So we'll spend most of the time in chapter six on these. And then we'll spend you know a day or two on trapezoids because there's only one subcategory. And then we'll get to the kites. That's usually where we end. All right, let's move on here. Let's get rid of that. All right, so <coughs> parallelogram. Um, with the opposite sides being parallel. So it's a four-sided figure. The walls are parallel. But now, the subcategories to it. There's two subcategories, two main subcategories. One of them is called a rectangle. Okay, now the definition of a rectangle, we'll get this later in one of the later sections. I think it's like the third section, I think, we get into rectangles, I think. Uh, but anyways, the rectangle, by definition, it's a four-sided figure, the walls are parallel, and it has four right angles. That's it. That's the definition. Now, on this picture, what you're actually seeing is that certain walls are equal. Okay, you're seeing the, the little markers. That's one of the properties about being a rectangle. But the, the actual definition, it's a four-sided figure, walls are parallel, and four right angles. That's what makes a rectangle. Now, the other subcategory to a parallelogram, you know, having walls that are parallel, is called a rhombus. A rhombus, by definition, is a four-sided figure, walls are parallel, and four congruent sides. Every wall there on that picture is equal in size. So the top, bottom, right, and left, they're all the same. So it's like a perfect diamond. A lot of people think it looks like a kite. Not quite. Kites, if you want to know, kite is more like this. This is a kite where the top two are equal and the bottom two are equal to each other, but not all four. So usually the, on, a, on a kite, the bottom two are actually longer than the other two. Now, a kite is not a parallelogram. Um, we'll actually talk about one of the properties about what makes parallelograms you know, unique. The kite itself doesn't fit the mold, and you'll see it in the first property we hit. Okay. All right, now the other category, now this is not a subcategory, this is just like a weird blend of the two. The weird blend of the two is called, it's called a square. It's a perfect blend of both of those. So a square, a square is a rectangle, it is a, it is a rhombus, but it's, but it's going one step further. It's a four-sided figure, walls are parallel, it's got four right angles, four equal walls. 
So it's kind of a mixture of both of these. Um, this one in particular has every property of the other two and the parallel when we start focusing. So what I want you to remember, and this is like one of those things, and we'll get to the waterfall chart here in a minute. When we start learning properties in the first section, chapter six, and we get to the second section of chapter six, and we get to the third, all the properties are still being used all the time. So when we start learning properties in section 6.1, you gotta remember them for the later sections because a square has all of them, has all the properties we learned. So you gotta keep track of like the different theorems and the different properties we have. So you gotta remember that they apply, especially when we talk about parallelograms. So the square has all, all the properties we for. And again, the waterfall chart will explain. And we'll use that a lot throughout the chapter six. So I'll keep bringing that up. All right, questions on the main terms. Now again, in these sections, um, in the sections uh, through, throughout chapter six, we'll eventually learn properties that are very specific about each of these. But you gotta remember that they do flow and you don't wanna forget certain properties as we go through chapter six. All right, the other shape was called a trapezoid. Okay, a trapezoid only has one pair of sides or parallel. This is the shape I showed you earlier, but there's a subcategory. There's only one subcategory to a trapezoid, and it's called an isosceles trapezoid. Isosceles, we've had isosceles triangles. It's where two walls are equal. Well, this is the same thing on, a tra on an isosceles trapezoid. Um, it has a pair of sides that are parallel, and then the other pair are equal, not the same pair. So you have a parallel wall, top and bottom, and then you have the other two that are equal. But again, I'll bring these up every time we get to a new section. I'll probably have these specific slides back again. And maybe I'll add another definition or I'll put a theorem in there. Um, so we'll, we'll try to review as we go a lot so that you're not forgetting. You can remember like, oh, yeah, I could use that property back from section 6.2 in this section because it has the same, you know, has the same style. But these are all the shapes. Like, this is what we're gonna learn about. Now, obviously, the kite's the extra one. That's the later one. But these are all the quads for right now. These are the main ones that we focus a lot in geometry. So today is kind of like, it's kind of giving you the, the overview of like what we're gonna learn throughout all six sections of chapter six. From 6.1 to 6.6, over the next you know two weeks or so, that's what we're gonna learn about. All right, we're good though? All right, now the waterfall chart. Um, this is just something I always try to bring up um, all the time. The waterfall chart is something that we're gonna use to, to highlight when certain properties go with other shapes. So like when we first start learning about quads, like today we're gonna learn one of the first properties that applies to every type of shape. The property I'm gonna show you will apply to all the subcategories below it as well. Cause like we're gonna learn how to find interior angles, exterior angles, and diagonals. So they apply to all the ones below it. But when we get into like the subcategories, on like a parallelogram. The properties you learn about parallelograms flow down the chart to the other categories. So like there's specific theorems. I think I think the next section, section 6.2, I think we learned three theorems right off the bat that just apply to these. So then you gotta remember those properties we learn apply to the subcategories. So they'll apply to rectangles, which have their own, and we'll, they'll apply to rhombuses, which have their own, and then those all flow down the, the waterfall to the pool at the bottom, which all the properties apply to the square. And so these are the later sections. So the parallelogram is, I think, the second section. These are the third sections. Uh, then the fourth goes into like trapezoids and fifths into the subcategories. And the sixth section is about kites. It's usually how it works. But these are all the properties. And again, when we start learning, I'll come back to this. And what we'll try to do is, if you have this chart in your notes, We'll try to write down the theorems that apply. So like when we get certain theorem numbers, we'll write them down next to these names so you know which theorems you need to look up because there is quite a few of them. This chapter has kind of quite a few theorems because there's so many shapes and they're very specific. Okay, we're good though? Let's get to our first three properties today. First three, they're very super, super, super simple. They're not overly difficult. It's just applying um, properties to basic Okay, so one of our first properties, this is the first theorem in chapter six, okay? Um, it talks about the sum of the interior angles of an n-sided convex polygon. That's a mouthful, there's a lot of vocab words there. 
So I'll let you write that down. We'll talk about it. There's an actual formula. It's very easy. It's just this little simple formula that we're going to use. Um, but we need to talk about the vocab words, obviously. There's a ton of words there in that simple sentence. And then we there is a name to this theorem, obviously. Now, we've actually seen a version of this, this theorem earlier. It was in Chapter 4. It was actually like the first theorem in Chapter 4. Um, the interior angles of a triangle. And you sum all the interior angles of a triangle. What does triangles have to add up to be? 180. That's a part of this theorem. But this applies to any polygon, any n-sided polygon. We'll talk about that in a minute. Now, obviously, vocab words, as you're writing this down, vocab words, like the word sum. What does the word sum mean? The yeah. Problem. Yeah, the, uh, the answer to an addition. So we're going to be adding something, right? So we're going to be adding interior angles. So that's, so that's our next word, right? Interior angles are angles that are on the inside of your picture. So angles on the inside. So it doesn't matter what type of polygon you have, because they said we're using an n-sided polygon. N-sided means n number of sides. N number of sides. So why do they say the word n? Any number you want. N number. It's like a variable. So somebody just pick a random number. 11. 11-sided 11 polygon. So that instead of n, you'd put an 11 here. 11 number of sides. Okay? So that would be a hendecagon, right? We can use this theorem to figure out what the angle should add up to be when you add them all up. So it's an n number of sides, right? n sided. Now, convex. Convex means um, it doesn't have a cavity to it. There's no, uh, there's no concavity. So whatever picture we're going to pick, now if I pick you know, the pentagon, right? It can't have a cavity, so I don't want having, I don't want to have that cavity on the inside like that, where it has like a little like a cave or mouth or Pac-Man, you know. I don't want that dent on the inside. They have to be convex, so it has to be bowed outwards. So it's big and fluffy pillows. The reason why I want this is that every angle on the inside, whatever these angles are, because they, they could be different. It doesn't have to be all the same angles. These could be all different angles. Whatever these angles are, they always have to be less than 180. Every single angle. So they're, they're all acute or obtuse angles. So acute through obtuse, but not straight. They can be right angles, I don't care about that, but anything from acute up to obtuse on the inside. And we're going to add them all up. And notice I didn't write reflex, or I didn't write reflex angles, so that's why I can't have a, why I can't become cave. Reflex angles are anything bigger than 180. And if you had a cavity to it, you'd have one of those. So these are convex pictures only. Okay. And then obviously they're polygons, so they have to have straight edges, no curves. You don't want to draw curves on the shape. So, so those are the basic vocab words. Okay, now the, the generic formula that we're going to be using, the generic thing, is this. That's your formula right there. This is the part you need to have written down. This is one of your, it's going to be one of the first homework assignments you're going to have. It'll be one of the first problems on your next chapter test. Then I'll give you shapes, and you have to figure out the number of, you know, what the interior angles allow to be. So um, that shape we picked earlier, what was the hendecagon, the 11-sided figure? The 11-sided figure. We can figure out what all the interior angles add up to be. All of them. Because you plug the 11 into this formula. So how this works, if, it's, if you have a picture that's 11-sided, you take the 11, you plug it into n. So 11 minus 2 and then you take that times 180. And this will tell you what all the angles should add up to be no matter what type of hendecagon you have. So 11 minus 2 is 9, and you're going to take 9 times 180. And so that's a 0, that's a 2, 37, um, that's 1620. Somebody do some math. Somebody have a copy of your phone? You agree on it? 1620? Okay. And that's what all the angles should add up to be. So if you had you know, 11 sided polygon. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. There you go. There's my 11 sided polygon. Right? You add up all these angles, whatever they are, there should be 11 angles in there. Right? They, they have to add up to be 1620, no matter what. Now, if they're all the same angle, 
So let's say it's a regular, so all the angles are, it's equal angular, all the angles are the same, but I can figure out what each one would have to be. Because if there's 11 angles on the inside, there's 11 vertices, you divide this by 11. And you have what each one should be. So here you want to get that in your calculator, take 1620 and divide it by 11, please. 147.27. Okay. That's what each angle should be if they're all the same angle. So they're all two. So we can kind of see that. From my picture, they all look very, very big. You know, they're big angles in there. Just, to, just trying to attempt to draw an 11 set of polygon, I was drawing very large angles. But again, this formula, all it does is tells you what they should add up to be, the 1620. And it does it, it works for any picture. So I can go a 20 sided polygon. You know, I could go a triangle and it would still work. In fact, just to prove the point that it does work for a triangle, we already know what triangles have to add up to be. They have to add up to be 180. This formula works for that. So, you know, a triangle has, what, three sides to it? Three minus two, and you take that times 180. So three minus two is one, you take one times 180, and duh, that's 180. So it does work. It's, it, it's a very generic form. Now, my goal is to show you why. Like, how did they come up with that? That's what I want to show you right now here in a minute. Okay, let me restart camera here. Okay, so just to show you kind of where this formula came from, they basically took any shape you want and they split it into, into triangles. And then they're adding up how many triangles you have on the inside. That's what they're doing. Okay, so let's say like I go to that pentagon like I drew earlier. Right? So you have a pentagon, and you pick one of the vertices, and you, you separate the drawing into triangles. So I'm going to I'm gonna draw these diagonal lines going through. These are called diagonals. You're going to other vertices. And you can see how many triangles I have. There's actually three triangles in there. So each triangle has to add up to be 180 degrees. That's what this formula is doing. So when I had a five-sided polygon, which was the pentagon, right? you put five into the formula, so five minus two is three, and that's what it's doing. It's taking your picture, your five-sided polygon, which is the pentagon, and breaking into three triangles. And you add up to three triangles. Because, and I know some people looking at the little ward, how do you know it's three triangles? You can see them here. You can see what the triangles are. When you add these up, it gives you all the interior angles. Because you can actually tell, it's actually giving you all the angles in the corners when you add them all up together. It's not giving you angles on the inside, it's giving you all the, the, the vertices angles, eventually. That's why the formula works. It's splitting a polygon into to smaller triangles. That's why I said, like, knowing a triangle is the first polygon you have to learn. Because everything we, we learn from after triangles apply to triangles. They, they flow backwards. Okay, questions on the formula? Okay, tomorrow, you know, um, one of our hands-on activities. Um, I'm gonna have I'm gonna test whether you know how to use that formula. So I'm gonna I'm gonna ask you a couple questions like what do the interior angles of this picture need to be? Like what do they need to add up to be? That's how you find it. Type in how many walls there are, you subtract two, take your times under me. Alright. Let's move on to the next formula. The next theorem. Oh, by the way, the name of this one, as you can probably tell, it's called the interior angle theorem. Now, the one we had back in Chapter 4, the first theorem in Chapter 4, was called the Triangle Interior Angle Theorem. This is just called the Interior Angle Theorem and applies to any polygon. Okay, we're good. Okay, second theorem. Second theorem today. The sum of the exterior angles of an n-sided convex polygon. So now, the new word there is exterior angle. We talked about that a little bit in chapter four. We did exterior angles for triangles. I think it was like the third section of chapter four. I didn't put any on the last chapter test. It wasn't crazy important that we got to it because uh, we're going to do exterior angles in this, in this section. Exterior angles. So these are all the angles on the outside. And it's different than what you think. Uh, we'll go through the formula here in a second, uh, but whatever shape you have, let's go to that, that pentagon. We keep using the pentagon today. But here's my pentagon. 
An exterior angle is not this one. This is what always people always have this assumption that this is an exterior angle. It's the angle on the outside. Not quite. Um, it's kind of a misconception. You don't just use the entire angle. Um, exterior angles are angles that are, are, are um, they have to be less than a straight angle. They have to be less than 180 degrees. So how do you find exterior angles? You pick one of the walls. I don't care which wall you start with. Let's say I start with this wall. Let's call this wall number one. And you extend it straight out. You just extend the wall straight with like a straight edge. That's an exterior angle. And then you keep rotating. You always go clockwise. That's what I always do. So I'm going to go clockwise from here. Pick this wall and extend it straight out. And there's your exterior angle. And then go clockwise again. So I'm going to go over here now. And you extend this wall straight. So here's your exterior angle. And then I go clockwise again. So I go to here. And extend this wall straight. Here's your exterior angle. That kind of looks like a right angle. And then I go to the last wall. So then I go up here and extend this wall straight. And here's your last exterior angle. Kind of looks like a saw blade. Saw blade really represents exterior angles really well. But again, you just go clockwise. You pick one wall, extend it straight, and then go clockwise from there and extend that wall straight. And these are all the exterior angles. So what this theorem will do is it will tell you what all these should add up to be on your picture. Now, there's an easy way to find it um, if you have the interior angles. So if you had all the interiors, let's say you had what these are, like some of these are 90s, let's say, and you had all the other <coughs> numbers, right? You could find the angles next to it because these have to add up to 180, these have to add up to 180, these have to add up to 180, and that has to add up to 180. So you could always find the one on the outside really easily and then add them up. But this formula will just tell you what they have to add up to be. So it's, it's kind of weird how this works. I'm going to show you the formula here, and it's the easiest thing in the world. So even if it was a pentagon, or a hendecagon, or a dodecagon, this is the formula you have. It's not really a formula. It's one simple number. It doesn't matter what shape you pick. When you do the exterior angles and you add them all up, on any polygon you have that has straight walls, it will always add to be 360, no matter what the shape is. It could be a 20-sided polygon. It could be a triangle. They will always add to be 360, which is the weirdest thing in the world. It always works. It doesn't matter. Okay, just to prove my point that you know a triangle, the exterior angles add to be 360. Okay, I'm going to make it a triangle. Let's, let's use a right triangle just to because that's kind of easy. Uh, somebody give me the other two angles in my right triangle. Somebody give me just one. 26. 26? Okay, if this is 26, then this angle up here has to be 84. Uh, not 84, geez, 64. It has to be 64. Now, the reason why I know that, um, in a right triangle, they have to add up to 180, right? So they have to add up to 180. These have to add up to 90, which they do. That's a 90, so it adds up to 180. Uh, when I do the exterior angles, you extend the wall straight, then I go clockwise, extend this wall straight, then I go clockwise, extend that wall straight, and these are the exterior angles of my triangle. What this theorem says is that they have to add up to be 360, no matter what you do. No matter what triangle you picked, or whatever shape you have. Okay, now to find the, the angle on the outside, this angle has to add with the 26 to make 180. So this angle out here, has to be a 1, what is that, a 1, uh, 54, to add to be, this has to add to be 180. Uh, over here, this is a 1, 16, that adds with the 64 to make 180, and if that's 90, then this one also has to be 90. Does it have to add to be 180 with the one next to it, because that's what exterior angles are. Well, when you add these up, 154, 90, and 116. Hinker, can you add those up for me on your calculator, please? Three sixty. It works. It's the weirdest thing in the world. It's just it's so weird that no matter what shape you pick, it will always have to be three sixty. So if we went to you know the quad, we went to. Um, we go to the pentagon, we go to the hexagon, they'll always have to be 360s on the outsides. Those three angles on the outside. Okay, 
that's it for today. We're gonna stop there. Now there's one extra property we'll probably look at it tomorrow. The goal tomorrow is to hopefully get a chance. We're gonna look at the test. I'm gonna look at that right in the beginning. If we hopefully we get more people to take my test today. Trying to see. There you go.